again in Spanish. To Chalice Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a community of diverse beliefs and experiences, nurturing the li liberal religious spirit and united by our desire to grow in love and in service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your life's journey, you are welcome here. Whether you gather with us every Sunday, once or twice a year, or are with us this morning for the very first time, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Jessica Schultz, and I'll be the worship associate today with my husband, John Schultz, assisting. Our worship musician this morning is Tim McKnight, and our song leader is Callie Leaf. Our tech team consists today of Sarah Komnick, Dean Gadette, and Hope Campbell. Our online chat host is whoever has happened to be on chat today, so somebody take charge up there in the chat group. Our pulpit guest this morning is Isaac Castro, currently a fourth year seminarian at Star King School for the Ministry and a member at First Church UU San Diego Congregation. Isaac and I have passed a rapid test this morning, so you will see us leading worship without our masks. Welcome to our Sunday worship service and with welcome to those of you here in the chapel and those of you watching live via Zoom. For those of us in the chapel, you will notice that we have our windows open. This is to ensure good air cir circulation in the room. There are also four air purifiers in the room. Please feel free to leave the chapel at any time if you are uncomfortable. You'll be able to hear what's happening in the chapel while you're outside in the courtyard. Probably not in the back, but just in the courtyard here. For those of you using Zoom, please notice on your Zoom menu that there's a chat button. You are welcome to use that chat box, box during the service, but remember to uh, make sure you're directing your messages to everyone, everyone in the chat group, so that everyone there can see what's being shared. We are always delighted to see newcomers joining us in service, in worship. As a newcomer, you might be interested in the groups and activities we offer here at Chalice. A good way to get this information is through our email newsletter and e-news calendar. For online newcomers, toward the end of the service, there will be a link online in the online chat box where you can add your name to the email list. And in-person newcomers, if you haven't already given us your email address when you signed in, please share it before you leave. Our weekly email is truly the best way to get information about the many groups and activities that we offer here at Chalice. And now, let's take a breath together. I'm Judy Cavallo. I'm Steve Schlesinger. And we live on land stolen from and the, the Payam Coetion, now known as San, San Marcos. Marcos. My name is Dennis Brown, and I live on land stolen from the Payam Coetion, now known as Marietta. My name is Dre Marsh, 
and I live on land stolen from the Kumeyaay and Payam Kuisham, now known as Escondido. My name is Jeff Harley. I live on land stolen from the Payam Kuisham. That area is now known as Vista. I'm Debbie Street Idell. I live on land stolen from the Kumeyaay. It's now known as Scripps Ranch. My name is Amaki Ayipa, and I live on land stolen from the Payoquichim, now known as San Marcos. Now we light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. I invite David Peel forward to light our chalice this morning. The flaming chalice was first used during World War II by the Unitarian Service Committee as a symbol of life-saving refuge for people fleeing persecution in Europe. The Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, president of our Unitarian Universalist Association, reminds us that the symbol of our faith is a symbol of resistance to Nazism and a symbol of safe passage for refugees. today is adapted from the writing of Tim Haley. Amid all the noise in our lives, we take this moment to sit in silence, to give thanks for another day, to give thanks for the gift of life, to open ourselves here now to the process of becoming more whole, of living more fully, of giving more freely, of understanding more completely the meaning and value of all lives here on earth. And now here's one of my favorite things. Uh, this is uh, the first week bef of, of Advent, the four weeks before Christmas. Inspired by the Christian observance of Advent, we approach the winter holidays by lighting candles in the four weeks before Christmas. The tradition of Advent candles reaches back to pre-Christian Northern Europeans. During the darkest days of winter, they lit as many as 24 candles on an evergreen covered wheel or wreath. By lighting a candle a day, they mark time, anticipating the return of the sun's light and warmth. 
Now we light the candles to remind us of the gathering darkness and the blessings to be found in the many stories and symbols of this time of year. We light the first candle of Advent for joy. May it shine for all who find delight, even in the midst of challenge and struggle. Please remain seated while we join, while we join in singing. Please join me in song 1059, May Your Life Be a Song. This is a new Advent song for us, so Tim will play it through once first. is the shared spiritual practice of our community and we tend to the congregation during this time by sharing and honoring our joys and sorrows. Here in the chapel, you are welcome to write your joy or sorrow on a candle card, which will be collected from you. Online, please write your joy or sorrow, including your name, and press enter to send it to chat. These joys and sorrows will be spoken out loud and then we will remove this part of the service from the recording that goes on our YouTube channel so no one will be able to publicly view this sharing online. So now we will have a few minutes of music so that you can write down what you would like to share.
light a final candle for all the joys and sorrows that go unshared and unspoken this morning. We hold these two in the love and support of this community. Before We Eat, From Farm to Table, written by Pat Brisson and illustrated by Mary Azarian. As we sit around this table, let's give thanks as we are able to all the folks we'll never meet who helped provide this food we eat. They plowed the ground and planted seeds tended fields, removed the weeds. They picked the food at harvest time, working in the heat and grime. They grazed the cattle, fed the sows, gathered eggs, and milked the cows. They fished from boats out on the seas, raised wheat and nuts and honeybees. Thank the ones who packed the crates, sorted boxes, checked the weights, thank the drivers on the roads in their trucks with heavy loads, and all the clerks at all the stores who did the grocery selling chores. Thank the ones who bought this food, the ones who teach me gratitude. Sitting at this meal we share, we are grateful and aware, sending thanks upon the air to those workers everywhere. I'd like to thank Patty Carlisle for for this reading that she found for us for today and, and every all the readings that I'm reading today, actually. Thank you, Patty. This is a prayer addressing all hungers by Deborah Smith. <clears throat> we are hungry. We are eating our daily bread and bowing our heads, and yet we are hungry. We are thanking the farmer and the farm worker, and yet we are hungry. We are speaking in spaces for food that is healthy, and still we are hungry. We are tired of slogans that say, feed the children and mean, feed the children leftovers. We are hungry for something that feeds more than bodies. We are hungry for help. Help us, O oh, you who apportion the funds, find in your heart the child who you were who would share with a friend, free and friendly. Lead us not into meanness, for we are hungry. We want the loaves and the fishes, the water and the wine of sweet justice for all. We are hungry. I think food justice is all about making sure that people have the tools and resources that they need to make the food yeah. choices that they want. Food justice, the right to have healthy food in abundance in your home or in your community. Justice in the food practice is we need to make healthy food available for everyone 
independent of their income, independent of their skin color, independent of where they live. Everybody needs to have access to those basic foods that keep them healthy. Food justice to me, I think, means food is available to those who need it when they need it. And that when they need it, there's choice available, and that part of that choice includes some healthy choices. I got some green beans in here. Are they nice? Oh, they're beautiful. Highest quality I picked get? this morning. So I think food justice for some would be access to the opportunities of healthier items. It helps us get through the day and nutritional value. To me, it's doing justice with the food, to care for it as you would care for it in your own fridge at home, and to make sure that it's being used by somebody who needs it instead of being put into a landfill somewhere. It's about access to food, but it's also access to the story around food and then the implication of that story on whatever community is telling it. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Um, for this sermon, uh, I want to share, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this really bad taste like joke. Um, how do you know if someone's vegan? Don't worry. They'll tell you within the first two minutes of meeting them. <laughs> and while there's some minor humor in this joke, I also know some use it as a scoff. At, at vegans, and that's not okay. But I'm sharing it today because of the truth in my past interactions. I recall when folks told me they were vegan in the early part of meeting them, and it was usually because I would offer them some kind of meal or snack, and they couldn't partake in it. And in their polite decline, they would volunteer being vegan as to why. That's why we usually found out. Society has created a situation where it's rude to say no without an acceptable reason. And vegans got the brunt of that joke for a long time. I'm sure some of them still do, and that's unfortunate. I know pretty much, I'm gonna say all of you, are just meeting me today, but I also have an unfortunate news to share with you. While writing this sermon, I began crafting something I felt would go over well with you. I had in my mind that I would tell you about some of the many layers of food justice. I planned on pulling from our UU sources and pointing out how food and feast have been present throughout religious communities for as long as history tells us. Adam and Eve got kicked out of Eden for eating an apple, a tale of Jesus feeding 5,000, from five loaves of bread and two fish. Day of the dead, people placing favorite fruits on altars of their beloved dead. Rosh Hashanah, apples dipped in honey to celebrate a sweet new year. The Muslim festival of sacrifice, where the sacrifice refers to an animal in remembrance of the story of Ibrahim and his son Ismail. How moon cakes are the hallmark food of the mid-autumn festival a cultural and religious holiday celebrated during the fall harvest. But in my dreams, my ancestors came to me and told me I needed to go deeper. So I planned on weaving those above with a story from a local city, Al Cajon, and their ban on feeding the homeless from October 2017 through January 2018. How a group of activists came together dubbed themselves Break the Ban, and shared food and public spaces until they were cited. While the city of Al Cajon flexed its muscle with a $1,000 fine and even possible jail time for breaking the ban. And it wasn't until January 2018 that the group was finally cited and why that mattered 
is that it could be challenged in court because the following week, the ban was lifted. Still, my ancestors, my ancestors came to me again and said to go deeper. So I began writing about food justice as a call to action for immigrant raids in chicken processing plants. In raids on August 7, 2019, agents arrested 680 immigrant workers from seven different chicken processing plants in central Mississippi the largest single state immigration enforcement operation in US history. I wanted to call your spirits to this piece because before those raids, the workers were union organizing for better working conditions and higher wages. As things were looking to be in the hands of the workers, the owners, Coke Foods, quietly requested a raid at their plants. I wanted to weave in how the fight for unions is a part of food justice. Still, my ancestors came to me again and told me I needed to go deeper. And so I asked them, how can I go deeper? Give me some kind of sign. The next day, I started writing about wages for migrant farm workers. In September 2020, the US Department of Agriculture announced that it no longer intends to collect data on the money paid to those uh, keeping Americans fed. Today's migrant farm workers make an average just under $13 an hour, a rate that varies by region. And by failing to conduct its traditional agricultural labor survey, such workers could be paid just the minimum wage. And that means in Georgia, Idaho, Iowa, and other ag powerhouses, that's as low as $7.25 an hour. And I wanted to speak about how the fight for living wages is built into food justice. So, I was weary of the impending visit in my dreams after this. And that night they came back to me and said, don't craft something you think others want to hear. Tell your journey of food and food justice. And similar to that video we just watched, the last commentator mentions, it's about access to food, but it's also about access to the story around food and the implications of that story around the community that is telling it. They were moving me to share my story with you, and by sharing it, it included them and the ways that they are affected by food justice. And let me just say, when ancestors visit you in your dreams and steer you in this direction, it's wise to listen <laughs> and follow through. So here's the journey. Food in my family has generational trauma. I have a Mexican background. Most of the elders in my family were migrant farm workers at some point in their lives. Many of them were, al many of them were also in immigrants. All of my grandparents worked in the fields at one period or another. My mom and stepdad used to work in the fields as children. They were as young as eight years old when they started. They worked hard to get out of that industry as they grew up because they didn't want their children to work in the fields. I remember visiting my Tata Biko in the fields while he was working the tractors. I knew part of those visits were because my parents never wanted us to forget where we came from and the hard work our ancestors put in for, our, for my current opportunities. And right now, I have an uncle-in-law who currently works in the fields. He hardly gets any days off during harvest season this past Thanksgiving, he had it off only because they had to work twice as hard on Wednesday to meet the two-day quota or else they would have had to come back to work on Thanksgiving. He didn't join us for our gathering because he was tired and wanted to sleep. I told my aunt I was glad he chose rest when his body was pushed to the limit. What I didn't say to her was that it's being pushed to the limit by the greed of farmers and lack and large ag businesses. Food in my family has cultural significance. There are recipes passed down for generations. Each recipe has a connection to someone in, in the past that we still cherish and honor in that dish, and how we used food before it was mainstream. I'll give you an example. Carne asada is a common staple in the Southwest region of the United States. It's also quite expensive now. 
My family remembers when it was considered the throwaway meat. It was thin and tough. It became the cheapest meat our communities could afford. And we seasoned, marinated, and tenderized it into the, 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 the deliciousness that meat eater masses enjoy today. You're welcome, by the way. <laughs> Food in my family has love baked into the recipe. Some of the most cherished memories I carry with my family revolve around mealtime. From the conversations while making food to the stories that come forth while sitting around the dinner table. I also grew up with a large family. I have 23 aunts and uncles. I have six siblings and way too many cousins to list. All of that means I experienced a lot of birthday celebrations throughout the year. And what we did for birthdays was celebrate by having a party with their favorite foods. I like to call it a birthday feast. Food in my family meant sharing with others. Giving to those who were experiencing food insecurity, we also invited others to join us as well. They were always, there was always extra seats, plates, and good food. And I'm not going to lie, some of it was spicy too. But we considered food, and specifically mealtime, a sacred space we were called to share with others in need. And while I got all these experiences from my family, I have to admit ignorance when it came to knowing about the larger umbrella of food justice. I'm going on 35 years old, and up until 10 years ago, I never even, even knew it was a thing. I first learned of the term food justice after visiting my UU congregation. I knew about food insecurity and lumped it in with that right away. Yeah, food justice. You know, feed those who are hungry and without. And while I wasn't completely wrong about one of the aspects of food justice, that was still very far from any type of proper definition. I had to learn it the hard way by messing up a lot. While I can't tell you every aspect of my messing up journey, I want to tell you about the first time I got it majorly wrong because that's the one that vividly sticks with me. I volunteered to host one of the UU young adult groups at my congregation. I was so excited to host, and even the topic was going to be a conversation revolving around food, genetically modified food to be specific. I got a nice variety of heavy snacks, and light snacks and refreshments, and was confident in providing a praiseworthy spread. And then it happened. Someone asked if there was anything gluten-free. Another asked what was vegetarian. A third asked about vegan options. Then someone inquired about something dairy-free to eat with the crackers besides meat. A few things fit in some of those asks, but not all. The truth is, I, a carnivore with no dietary restrictions, have bought food I liked, as I planned on taking home any and all leftovers. <laughs> I didn't buy the hummus and carrots we are used to seeing at UU gatherings. I felt terrible and small at that moment. Here I was just a few short weeks into finding this group, and I did this with food. I was upset with myself, because food is something that I cherish deeply and enjoy sharing, with, sharing it with others. Yet I had missed the mark on the dietary needs of many of the group's folks. It didn't even cross my mind to ask about those things. I had no clue what to do other than to offer my apology. Afterward, I went home embarrassed and felt I had disrespected some folks for not being as inclusive as they had been. So I started researching all those things I had messed up on. I was determined to expand and learn more so I didn't make a mistake around food again. Side note, I did continue to mess up, and after each failure, I made sure to do better. I like to call it my time with the fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning around food justice. My relationship with understanding food justice began to evolve through this, and it still is. I recall a particular time when our congregation sang the song, Fire of Commitment. And while, while I like the song, 
I was still new to UU spaces and hadn't paid enough attention to the lyrics previously until I had been doing my research on food justice and felt a connection with the main chorus. When the fire of commitment sets our minds and soul ablaze, when our hunger and our passion meet to call us on our way, when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within, then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can begin. I can't tell you how it felt as though this song was telling me about the journey I found myself on. My church was singing a sermon to me and they didn't even realize how beautifully potent it was during that time. As the years went by, I learned more about vegetarians, vegans, gluten-free, keto, plant-based diets, organic, ethically sourced foods, free range, farm to table, food allergies, food sensitivities, fair trade, and so much more. I even gave up sugar at one point to see how much of it was incorporated into the processed foods we eat. Answer, sugar is not a lot of things. It was hard to find stuff. I realized that a food war was occurring with many battles simultaneously happening from bans on feeding the homeless, raids on immigrants trying to form unions at food processing plants, the fight for wages for migrant farm workers, to food deserts where options are limited, to owning that the pesticides we must diligently wash off as worrying customers are most definitely dangerous to those working in the fields. And honestly, just access to affordable, healthy food options, because everyone deserves that right. As I've been sharing my evolving journey with food justice, the words of Francis Moore LaPay come to mind. They are the co-founder of Food First and share this in a piece entitled, Food as our most common bond. To me, democracy is an exciting living practice, what we do every day. To most, democracy doesn't relate to our daily lives and it sure isn't much fun. I now see that to engage in democracy, to jump into this living practice, we all need something tangible to act on. Because food is our most sacred primal need and our common bond, to the earth and to each other, it can ground us as we stretch ourselves to draw in all the interlaced threads so we can weave a whole meaningful picture for ourselves. With food as a starting point, we can choose to meet people and to encounter events so powerful that they can jar, jar us out of our ordinary ways of seeing the world and open us to new uplifting possibilities open us to new uplifting possibilities. I love that. I heard someone giving a talk about food get asked if they were an optimist of the future of food justice. They said, no, I'm not an optimist. And that's because I'm a possibilist. I believe in the active possibilities we can create around food justice instead of remaining in an innate optimistic state. I like to say, I too consider myself a possibilist, and I hope some of you fall in that category too, just didn't realize it. One way I've done this is by being proactive in my practices. I have multiple options for various dietary needs whenever I host events, and sometimes when I'm not hosting, if I know the host doesn't actively uh, practice these things. I don't give vegans a chance to announce it to the room because I'm already asking them before I invite them into my spaces. Then I make sure to announce all the inclusive foods options that cover the needs of many. I once coordinated a potluck that was strictly vegan and gluten free. And the food was good. It became important to me to make it a space everyone can find acceptance and belonging, especially at the root level of the food being provided. And I have to say, I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian, and I currently do not have diet, any dietary restrictions, but I know I do my best in making better choices in my daily meals with less focus on meats, an increase in veggies, and generally a wider, healthier variety. I shop at farmer's markets when I'm able, I buy fair trade as available, support small food businesses, and have a better understanding of where my food comes from and I still don't get it right all the time, but I'm getting better. 
I used to be intimidated by the number of onion layers involved in food justice. Yet over time, learning in small doses has helped me develop tools for long haul work. And I know it works for many others as well. So let's do small things with great love because that's how we'll make a big difference. I'll close with a prayer from President Susan Frederick Gray. Spirit of life, spirit of love and justice, plant in our hearts the deep knowledge of the gift of every life, of each of our lives, of every life as precious and whole and needed. May we find ways to learn more deeply, lean more deeply into practices that nurture wholeness and belonging in all of our communities and in our world. Amen and blessed be. and body and spirit to sing hymn 1028, Fire of Commitment. offering is an expression of the generosity that makes our congregational life possible. As Buddhist teacher Joseph Goldstein has said, it's important to understand that generosity is a practice. It's not just a single event. It's a quality in our hearts and minds that we can develop and cultivate. Please text your donation to Chalice if you haven't texted a donation before, know that once you text the amount, you'll get a reply with a link to follow to enter your credit card information. You have, if you have already entered this information previously when you donated, 
you won't need to do it again. If your Sunday donation is meant to be part of your pledge payment, please be sure to indicate pledge after the dollar amount. The phone number for tech donations will be on the screen in just a moment. Please give generously. Please join in dedicating our offering with words of with these words of affirmation. I challenge the union congregation. Our mission is to connect through worship, music, learning, and caring ministries. These words are from Peter Singer, professor of bioethics at Princeton University. I begin with the assumption that suffering from lack of food, shelter, and medical care are bad. My next point is this. If it is within our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it. Please rise in body and spirit to join in singing hymn 131, Love Will Guide Us.
our closing words come first from President Jimmy Carter. We know that a peaceful world cannot exist one-third rich and two-thirds hungry. And then from Pope Francis, so you pray for the hungry, then you feed them. This is how prayer works. Love and blessings to each of you. Before we close the service, I'd like to remind newcomers online to please lose, use that link in the chat box to add your name to our email list. And then finally, please join in drawing our time together to a close by singing the well. After our closing hymn, please return to your seat for some announcements. almost here. In six days, it's our winter party from five to seven out on the patio. We will be having a potluck. And um, thank you for all of you who have signed up already. If you haven't yet, in the e-news, there will be the sign up link so you can go and RSVP and sign up to bring something yummy. Um, and uh, you know, if you get to Saturday and you realize, oh my gosh, I forgot to sign up. What should I do? You should come anyway and bring whatever brings you joy. So, um, and in light of food justice, um, it would be very wonderful if you could note, like if something's vegetarian or gluten-free or vegan or contains dairy, contains meat, that would be really helpful for all of us who are, have, um, who are vegetarian or vegan or have various dietary restrictions. So, um, so also, it is out on the patio. The entire evening will be on the patio. So dress comfortably for the weather. It's likely to be a little chilly. Um, yeah, so um, bring a blanket if you choose. Bring that extra scarf. Um, it will be fun. Uh, oh, we'll have some heaters on the patio also to try to chase away the chill. Um, and there will be some wonderful musical entertainment. We're gonna have the chancel choir singing and several of your favorite musicians uh, bringing their special brand of joy to the evening. So yeah, hope you'll join us for great food and a good time. I can't wait. Um, a couple more announcements and then we'll be done. For the online folks, Please remember that coffee hour is in the same Zoom room as the service, 
There'll be a brief break for some music for about five minutes and then the Zoom me meeting will be opened up and people can chat with each other online. So stay tuned, don't exit. This information is for our in-person congregants. Please enjoy social hour with us on our courtyard where masks are optional. Or in the spirit of caring, you can take your refreshment into the blue room to visit with our online congregant. I should check, are we still doing that? Yes, we are, I'm sorry. Some, of, some have been able, unable to attend Chalice for a long while and would really enjoy the fellowship of your company. Remember that the children younger than five years old may not yet be fully vaccinated, so take care if you're around them. Coffee and refreshments are waiting for you on the far side of the courtyard by the hub kitchen. Please enjoy. Thank you very much. <laughs> 